On today's LA Currents, we sit down with outgoing president of LA City's Public Works, Kevin James, to discuss how COVID-19 has changed city services. We go in depth with Duncan Crabtree Ireland of SAG-AFTRA on reopening Hollywood with safety measures in mind. And finally, a conversation with downtown LA Assembly member, Miguel Santiago, on how he's working to address homelessness. Known as a political commentator who transitioned into public service, Kevin James talks about his roles in Los Angeles Public Works and getting the entertainment industry back and running. Well, obviously the pandemic shut down a lot of businesses, including film and television production, which is not really good for a city known for being the entertainment capital of the world. But things are opening up. I'm delighted to be joined today by Kevin James. So let's talk about opening, because as of June 12th, production is possible um, with all kinds of rules, restrictions, cautions, thoughts that have to go into it. So what are the parameters that a production could actually get rocking again? The entertainment industry with all of the guilds and unions, they all came together in a significant coalition um, and came up with their industry white paper. The industry white paper is what the state adopted and moved forward when the governor issued the path forward for the entertainment industry in the state of California. It is very detailed. Um, it covers everything from testing on site. There is going to be a required safety compliance officer that has been trained and certified that is required as well. Um, there are all kinds of new provisions regarding spacing, uh, obviously crowd scenes. Much of that uh, will be done virtually online with, uh, with what you can do with computer technology now. Um, and there will be um, definite interest in shooting outside, safer to be outside a bit. Uh, or in a large soundstage environment. Less of a focus early on for on-location filming. Uh, that's something that, uh, that I think is going to be a, a slower entrance back into the industry. And then naturally, any, any scenes like uh, sports where you have close physical contact, um, kissing, fighting scenes, uh, any, any kissing scenes, things like that. There's going to be a, an attempt to move away from that for the time being. You mentioned the safety officer. Every set has somebody on set who is responsible for making sure that the safety of the crew and the cast is in place. But this is a completely different human. This has to be someone with some sort of medical expertise, I imagine. So, well, there's a certification process. Um, they, uh, some of them, I expect some of them will, will have um, a CERT background, uh, you know, EMT background maybe. Certainly the folks that are the safety compliance officers will have to meet the standards that are set forth in there. How do you see this slowly rolling out? Do you see it rolling out exterior-based commercial infomercials that sort of semi-roll into shiny floor sh shows? My guess, I mean, again, it's a guess, but it's an educated guess. Right. Uh, our first uh, permit is for a commercial. Mm -hmm. uh, we expect commercials for on location uh, to, um, to be the, the first ones to roll out for a number of reasons. One, they're smaller, right. uh, easier to contain, smaller footprint. Shows that are easily done with a small crew on a large soundstage, cooking shows, and some of the reality shows, uh, the bigger challenges are going to be the larger productions with larger budgets that have larger risk. Well, this is only a fraction of your world. True. <laughs> I mean, uh, with Public Works, obviously it coordinates with the film industry very strongly, but you also have to deal with a lot of things just in general with the city. And with COVID, you have had to make some pretty, uh, I would imagine, substantive changes within True. the Public Works. So what were some of the highlights there and how have you adapted? One of the, the largest highlights, Maria, is just the, um, the fact that we were able to continue our Public Works services through COVID really without interruption. Uh, we maybe had two or three trash routes. Uh, that's among all the routes in the city that had to be rescheduled in the first couple of days for trash pickup, um, but we stabilized very quickly. One of the problems that we saw um, was immediately once COVID hit, uh, some of uh, our recycling facilities closed down because oh. of closeness of, uh, and proximity of, of, of workers, very important for their safety. 
So we had a period of time, basically for about six weeks, some material was landfilled, recyclable material was landfilled because there was nowhere else for it to go. One of the interesting questions that we would get is, if even from the press, if some of this material is now being landfilled, why are we still telling people to put it in their blue bin? Uh, why not just have them put it in the trash? And it's because the answer was we never want people, it's, it's taken years, oh, decades, to train people in habits. And once we've got people in those habits, we don't want to move them for something that we knew would be temporary. Now, interestingly enough, you remind me of something else we were able to do as a result of COVID. People were staying home more. They're not in their offices, they're in their homes. So trash that they generate increases naturally, plus their kids are home, the whole family's there. Um, and so what we did with sanitation is we let people know if you have additional trash, leave it out there on the side and we will pick it up same trash day. Oh. Um, so for free. Uh, so that's something that we were able to do as well and we've continued to, to be able to do that. So just another example of, uh, of what Public Works has been able to do. We also have the opportunity now um, of rethinking our alfresca dining uh, uh, and dining outdoors, of course, and uh, what we use um, our street space and sidewalk space, I should say, for, for outdoor dining. And we're also working to find a way to, uh, to include our street vending community as well in some of those common spaces so that we have the full cultural and foodie experience that's so special in Los Angeles, maybe expanding now as we look at how we, uh, how we restructure it. I had had the opportunity to speak with city planning and one of the things that they obviously permit is the alfresco dining. Do you think that's something that's going to last past the crisis? I do. Because we have the, obviously we have the weather and we have the environment that naturally you know, and I would, add, I would add one more thing. I think the weather and the environment are significant, but something if you talk to restaurant owners that they'll say before was, look, we are a dense city, uh, particularly in, in specific areas, uh, and the permitting process can be challenging. And what we're learning new ways uh, is uh, right now with COVID is expediting these permits and, and taking down some of the, the barriers that had long existed just because it was institutional sometimes. Uh, and we're rethinking that process with planning, with street services, with engineering. So I think once you make it easier for these restaurants, they'll be much more interested in it because it also makes it more affordable for them. It is fascinating how uh, fast government has seen its ability to move in this crisis. So I seriously doubt anyone's going to tolerate any movement backward in that regard and making everything move slower. <laughs> we will see. We'll certainly hear from them if it's attempted. Lots of projects, lots of hats, but one of the newest hats is the Office of Petroleum and... Well, it's the Office of Petroleum and Natural Gas Administration and Safety. Okay. So, uh, long acronym. Uh, it's our Petroleum Regulation Office, really. Um, and it, I think it's more of an energy office, uh, it just has the name Petroleum currently, but this has been an office that's been long coming in the city of Los Angeles. It actually existed some 30 years ago after the Aliso Canyon gas leak. Um, it, it, that's a, a really call to action on creating and building this office. Um, so it was created and built within the Board of Public Works. It's very important to finally give neighborhoods and communities a place in city government where they can go to with these environmental uh, health issues uh, that relate to our communities and something that wasn't focused on and not much attention paid to it for a very long time. It is first a way in the city of Los Angeles to start to restore some of the environmental justice to our communities that have long been in need of it. So along with uh, the industry and with the crisis within you know, the pandemic, you also uh, had an interesting experience uh, with the protests that called your department into action because at the beginning of the protest, there was a certain um, exceptional element to it, which was not necessarily part of the protest, but was destructive with graffiti. Right. And how did your office deal with that right off the bat? So on really in two, two areas, or three. Graffiti, as you mentioned. Um, and then when people protest, even the most peaceful protests, uh, it's amazing how clean some of the protests have been with, with uh, debris that's left behind. But even the most peaceful protests, people drop things on the ground, there's destruction. So with trash pickup, with graffiti removal and after uh, some of the destruction that happened to some of the businesses, uh, our teams were out helping businesses clean up uh, from glass and, and other items that had been destroyed in some of the very unfortunate uh, uh, looting that we saw happen in our city. Um, and we continue to get compliments from communities and from the business community regarding how quickly 
some of the, uh, the graffiti was removed. We still want our city restored to its pre-protest condition after a protest. sag after is leading the way in safety to reopen Hollywood after months of shutdown. Productions are now cleared to roll camera. Since the 1930s, the union SAG and AFTRA have been advocating and protecting the rights of performing artists and media. Well, times have changed, but that doesn't mean the mission has. Managing these complicated arenas, I'm delighted to be joined by SAG COO and General Counsel, Duncan Crabtree, Ireland. Hi, now, that's a name for a marquee right then well, and there. <laughs> yeah, you know, I've often been told it sounds like I'm a law firm all by myself, but, you know, I mean, clearly hyphenated names are the way to go. You bet. So a lot is going on within the industry right now, but most importantly, the fact that production is starting to begin again. But with performing artists, I imagine there are a lot of rules and regs. So what are the protections that you are offering your performers to make sure that they're safe in the workplace? Uh, it's been a tough time, of course. It's been several months since anyone's been able to really get on a set and do any kind of production. Um, we estimate that our members have lost around $500 million in earnings during this time period. And uh, that's not just big stars, that's a lot of working performers who you know, rely on their income to pay a mortgage and pay their rent and uh, buy groceries and things like that. So we're really focused on helping everyone get back to work, but it has to be safe. So the kind of protections, like you asked, um, that we're looking for are really focused on Number one, making sure that there's some form of testing in place, COVID testing, uh, for people who are going to be working either as performers or with performers who have to work with no protective equipment on or you know, without physical distancing uh, in many cases. In addition to that, we're looking for uh, a zone system to be established on set. That basically means that there would be this sort of zone A area, the central zone, where performers and those who have to work directly with them are sort of in that zone. And then the rest of the crew who don't need to have direct contact with performers when they're not wearing masks, when they're not physically distanced, can be in a sort of outer zone. And why this is important is it helps inform the, the question of when people get tested, how frequently they get tested, things like that. Um, we've actually had the chance to work together both with the industry on a document that we've put out that lays out a lot of protocols and also separately with um, a group of the main labor unions in the industry. And we've really come up with what we think is a, a plan that can be practically implemented but that also provides uh, a high degree of safety for the performers and the crew who have to be working under those conditions. And so it, it really isn't going to be business as usual, but business can uh, be done, we think, with those kind of protections in place. One of the early adapters was the daytime drama Bold and Beautiful. It started back into production and then paused production. What happened? Well, you know, I, as far as specific productions, I'm not really at liberty to comment on their, on their productions. But what I can tell you is, in, in general terms, a few things. We've had a, a, a number of different productions start. We've had some commercials uh, kick back in. We have some feature films that are shooting, both here in Southern California and also around the world. Um, and we have some television uh, projects, uh, like the one you mentioned, that uh, have, have started back. In general, what those productions are finding is that the testing piece is really important because if you don't test people prior to everyone returning to set and then regularly test them thereafter, what's going to potentially happen is you may have an outbreak or a problem on set and then at that point you have to shut down because you've got an active COVID situation going on. So it's much better to really be preventive rather than not be preventive. And, and again, I'm not commenting on any particular production, but in general terms, that's one of the reasons why we feel um, testing is so important. And in fact, in the, the paper called the Safe Way Forward that the unions released, there's a section, part two of that paper, and I don't want to get too technical, but our epidemiologists that we work with put together a series of, of models of what could happen on a set of actually several hundred models they ran through a, through a computerized modeling system. And the result of that modeling was that if you have testing um, at a certain frequency, you can dramatically reduce the likelihood of any outbreaks uh, on set. 
And that's really important for the protection of performers, but that's also really important for protection of the industry because the industry needs to not have production start and stop and start and stop. And one of the best ways to prevent that is to have a, a good solid testing program in place. We've had a few productions, not many, but a few where one of the strategies is to actually quarantine the cast and the crew together and then try to use that as a way to help reduce the risk of an outbreak happening. There are pros and cons to each of those types of strategies and I personally don't expect to see quarantine being widely adopted uh, because of cost factors and other reasons attached to that. But I, I do think that everyone's trying to be creative and really make sure that that they're not the one who has a big outbreak on their set. I don't think anybody wants that. Nobody wants to be that no. person. Yeah. No. What are some of the things that sag after is doing to, to promote diversity and inclusion and actually maybe even um, adjust to the needs that obviously are very apparent? The first thing that I just want to mention is there are a lot of people who ask the question, uh, people of a certain age uh, might be more vulnerable to COVID or people with certain medical conditions might be more vulnerable to COVID. Is it okay for employers to ask about that or to decide we're not going to cast anybody over age whatever because uh, we are worried that they might be susceptible to COVID. And the EEOC has made it clear that's not okay. That is illegal discrimination. It's certainly not okay under our collective bargaining agreements. And we are being very proactive with employers to say, look, that's a decision that that person needs to make. If they need an accommodation under the ADA, then it's your obligation as an employer to work with them to do that. So you inform the person and let the person decide uh, what works for them rather than making broad-based assumptions just based on a factor like age or medical condition, etc. In terms of our other diversity advocacy, because we're always uh, trying to push in that direction, I think, you know, aside from the pandemic, there's obviously a broader social movement going on right now with Black Lives Matter, and obviously that's focused on the government and policing and, and those kinds of areas, but I think it's led to a broader conversation that's happening about inclusion and, um, and we're certainly interested in that. We have uh, a structure within our organization, both from our members and our staff, where we're constantly pushing for greater inclusion in the industry. And perhaps this uh, change in the way that production is made will provide us some opportunities to push forward in that as well. The word media has been redefined multiple times over in a very short period of time. Now we all have platforms and streaming services and gaming and everything like that that's now under the realm of these contracts. How complicated has just even the conceit of the unions become? Well, it's definitely, it's, it's grown a lot and it is very complicated. I mean, it's more complex than I think it ever was. We as a union are representing employees in really four different industries because we obviously have the motion picture, television, new media industry, we have broadcast journalism, uh, we have the music industry, and, um, and the advertising industry. So between those four industries, um, a lot of what they do is similar, but a lot of what they do is very different. And of course, our broadcast journalists and our, and our um, recording artists, um, they have some things in common and in some ways their work is very different. But one of the things that I think is most inspiring about working for SAG-AFTRA is watching our members stand up for each other and really seeing that solidarity. So when there's a tough contract negotiation uh, with a broadcast uh, station, let's say, we've got uh, our recording artist members will come out and they will um, be at a rally and uh, stand up for the rights of, of our other members. They, they really do have a sense of unity even when they work in different areas and different, different industries. And so I think that's something that's really powerful uh, and something that personally I'm very proud of. So I imagine performers really want to know as much information as possible during these times. So is there a place that they can go to? Is there a website that they can reference updated information? Absolutely. For the back to work uh, process, it's right there on our website at www.sagaftra.org slash back to work. And if people have uh, need more information about COVID specific resources, for example, unemployment, uh, offices, contacts for all of the 50 states and various other resources for that are specific pandemic information, that's on our website as well at www.sagaftra.org slash COVID-19. Thank you so much for all of this really interesting information and I certainly hope that the things continue to be safe and progress moving forward.
Assemblymember Miguel Santiago represents downtown LA in Sacramento, where he's working hard to address homelessness, which he calls the most pressing issue in our lifetime. It's amazing how much state government impacts local issues, and here to tell us all about it is Assembly Member Miguel Santiago from District 53. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you for having me on. So, what I need is a little bit of a civics lesson. How does the state government work? So there's 80 Assembly Members and 40 Senators, one Governor and Lieutenant Governor. Now here's a really interesting thing. The Lieutenant Governor is actually the President uh, of the Senate. And so that's why you have a Senate pro tem who actually leads the Senate, voted by their colleagues, uh, and this was established a long time ago. So if there needed to be a tiebreaker, the lieutenant governor can come in and do a tiebreaker. Kind of like you see the vice president come in and do a tiebreaker. Never really happens, but the vice president really would be the one who votes in the, in the Senate. A uh, little interesting fact bit right there. You're a local, right? You were born and raised in Los Angeles. That's why I feel very strong passion about this. Right here in our own backyard, uh, we have this huge fight on the um, most pressing issue in our lifetime, which is the issue of homelessness. The fact that we saw a 12.7% increase in homelessness as we taped this interview, that must have come as a real blow to you. The same way that it must have to any, any resident in the city of Los Angeles or, or the county or anybody in the state. I am frustrated. I am angry. We've got to blow up the system and do things a little bit differently. Uh, the same way of doing things is not going to work. Uh, we've thrown money at this situation, uh, but I think there has to be an acknowledgement uh, that we've got to do things a little bit different. And we've seen some promising uh, ways of that. Uh, during the pandemic, uh, we saw uh, the governor, we saw local municipalities move at a neck break speed. We've never seen this sort of collaboration. And the big question before us is, you know, is it going to stop because we had a pandemic? We've now learned to do some um, things a little bit differently, and we're just going to press that that only accelerates. People used to tell us in bureaucratic systems that you couldn't do this for a year. At neck break speed, we at the state unleashed almost 1,300 trailers. At neck break speed, we sent $150 million uh, out to the state. The city of Los Angeles got about 41. At neck break speed, the city of Los Angeles and the county are working together to house uh, uh, thousands of people uh, never been seen before. So look, there's a lesson there. You want to talk about a civics lesson? Here's the lesson. Move quick, move fast. If bureaucrats get in the way, run them over. But there's a way to do this. I mean, the old same way of doing things is just not going to work. We've got antiquated laws in the book that prevent us from helping somebody who was on the streets. Uh, we've got laws that were done uh, for very good intention that we've now broken through that help us uh, to create permanent uh, supportive shelters, sorry, permanent supportive housing and shelters in place. Look, I think it's time that, that we take a look at from this pandemic and say, here's what really worked, here's what didn't work. Because at the end of the day, lives are at risk. That's not, that's not just a saying, it's, it's not pandering, but literally lives are at risk. When you leave somebody on the streets uh, to live, uh, their life rots right before them and the people responsible are everybody who didn't do anything about it. So we've got a, an imperative to do something about it. It is unacceptable. What would be your plan? First off, the simplest way uh, to prevent a number of homeless increasing is to keep people in their homes. First, simple way to do it. Uh, and so we're working on, on eviction protection laws, we're working on tenants' rights laws. Uh, you're seeing now every level of government rowing in that direction and that's a very good first step. Uh, the next way uh, is to build the affordable housing needed. Lots of folks who are on the streets uh, for unfortunate economic circumstances land on the street. We know that. People don't want to be on the streets. People don't wake up in the morning and say, hey, look, I wish to, to not make my rent. I wish to be on the street. That just doesn't happen. That's a myth. What, what, what really is happening in some cases is if they were one paycheck away from being on the streets, uh, the pandemic did it. And when you drive by and you see tents, uh, you see people living in cars, uh, there are people trying to put their lives together, good, hardworking people who have landed on the streets. And let's be clear, there's different sorts of populations uh, of homelessness. But in this one particular uh, case, uh, the ability to build affordable housing to help them get back on their feet, uh, to give them the wraparound support services, uh, it, it is a simple, fast, effective way. Uh, but we've got to do a lot to do that, and I, I understand that. Uh, but that's one step. The other is, is those who we uh, take a look at like chronically homeless populations who, who have been on the street for some time and, and require uh, more wraparound support services and that's why we're very aggressive uh, in, in our policy pushes to build permanent supportive housing and emergency shelters uh, because 
permanent supportive housing along with the wraparound support services allows somebody uh, to sustain themselves and to live a productive life. And we see a lot of that in, in the downtown Los Angeles area and across the city of Los Angeles as it's getting built. With the pandemic, students were told to go online, but there is no such thing as broadband equanimity. And I know that that's important to you. So how is that whole issue of internet access and educational tools playing out? We're pressing uh, extremely hard for $500 million uh, in our state budget. So we're still in negotiations over that. Uh, and I also serve on the superintendent's task force to uh, bridge the digital divide. Mm -hmm. uh, we're also pressing for telehealth dollars because that we know during this pandemic uh, has become uh, more urgent and more important. Uh, and look, even if we didn't have a pandemic, there's a good case for why you don't need to leave your house to get a prescription. I mean, why should you go to your doctor to get a prescription? That makes no sense. Why, why would you go to the doctor to get an insulin prescription when, you, when they know you have diabetes or, or arthritis or some of, the, some of the easier things? Sure, maybe new diagnosis, but just a regular routine? I mean, this is LA, we have traffic, that makes no sense. So we're still making for those pushes. But when it comes to uh, education, uh, we feel very strongly about it because now that folks can't, or now that children can't go to their schools, um, we want to make sure that everybody has uh, both internet conductivity and also the laptops, uh, not just from the school side, but also from the student side to be able to uh, do their education. Now look, I'm a dad, uh, and, and I tried this online education. It is challenging. It would be that much harder if a student did not have an iPad or a laptop or internet to do it. We can't leave generations of children behind, particularly in communities of color, just simply because they couldn't afford it. It's up to us at the state to step up. There's been a lot of pessimism from the protesters about whether there's actually going to be any change. What has been the response in Sacramento and what are you seeing happening up there? Well, I'll tell you, look, we've already seen the change. Uh, many of us, including myself, ha ha had laid the groundwork uh, for the very the issue we just talked about, affirmative action. Uh, we have been talking about this for years. We've been trying to proceed with it. Um, I myself introduced Bob Bills, and Ms. Weber introduced Bob Bills, and Mr. Gibson introduced Bob Bills. These are conversations the legislature didn't want to have uh, years ago. And in fact, uh, Mr. Hernandez, uh, maybe a decade ago, um, introduced uh, the same bill and it didn't get a hearing in a committee. Folks who may not have been convinced in the past uh, saw the need for change and joined our efforts to make that change. And this year, uh, bills that we saw incredibly tough before uh, may get through. Uh, in the years of past, we fought, and, and I co-authored and co-authoring now, uh, independent review on law enforcement. Uh, it has been vetoed, it has been uh, uh, stalled in committees. I expect that to get to the governor's office. Why not? The time is now. And the demonstrations across the state, I think, will help us with that. Uh, police reform. The time is now. Look, uh, a couple of years ago, we had a robust debate. Uh, I was on the committee that helped uh, push out uh, the first bill ever in the, in, in the nation to uh, redefine what police use of force was. Um, and that was a hard, hard conversation, and many of us struggled to get it out of committee. Uh, I think that bill would fly out today. <laughs> Absolutely. So I think we're going to see some change, uh, and, and I think. I think um, the first place that you take a look at was ACA 5. Uh, this bill would have had a harder time in years past. And many of us who have raised this conversation were told uh, years ago, it's not the right time. The votes won't be there. At the beginning of the year, uh, our colleagues and I who proposed this bill, people sat with us and said, you're not going to get anywhere near 54 votes. I'd be surprised if you get the 40 votes. And we kept chugging, we kept pushing, uh, we barely got it out of, uh, out of committee, and we, con we continued uh, to push. And guess what? Even a Republican went on board with us on this. Times have changed. It's not the same California we saw before. And, and what we saw uh, what we're seeing now um, has had a huge impact on people. I mean, there is no doubt. You were the first in your family to graduate from college. You've taken on civic duty with a passion. What, would, what advice would you offer young people who don't actually see that in their future because of um, economic status or restrictions that they have in their world? When I talk to young people, I always say, you know, I, I want you to repeat after me. And, and raise your hand as loud as you can and shout as hard as you can with everything you've got in your might. I am going to go to college. You tell them the same way that I was told uh, that you are important and you're going to have a future. You're cared for and you're loved. You are going to college and you're going to make a difference.